What's up guys? Meathead Mason here with another book review, and this Spurrier here coming up with new ways to meddle in the global economy. This book review, which you know since you've already clicked on the video, I'm going to talk about A Tract on Monetary Reform by John Maynard Keynes. Now, John Maynard Keynes is one of the most impactful economists in the modern world, as he's the foundation for much of the interventionist economic policies invading our politics today. He's kind of given like a mathematical boon to any Marxist economists out there who are trying to like espouse socialist and totalitarian values. I will say John Maynard Keynes, he's brilliant. However, many, oftentimes his assumptions doom his analysis to be incorrect. In addition, the few times that he is actually correct, his words are misused and his message is perverted by the totalitarian tyrant. You may be shocked to find that it didn't take me long to find something I disagreed with. And what I mean is, as you can see on page one of chapter one, and it's actually the very first sentence, quote, money is only important for what it will procure. Thus, a change in the monetary unit, which is uniform in its operation and affects all transactions equally, has no consequences." End quote. Okay, so that would be true, except those caveats of if it affects all transactions equally is obviously completely impossible. So again, I stated in my, my intro, like his assumptions make his statements impossible, and that's an example of it, right? So let me give you a couple of reasons why that, that would be impossible. There's more than one currency in the world. So if, let's say, you're using the US dollar and it's devalued, everything purchased that involves external currencies, which now with the global market, the supply chain is fully integrated globally, it's, it will be impacted by prices because as the dollar decreases in value, the cost of all the inputs of every input for a, an item will go up. So therefore, the purchasing power of the individual will go down. Now, the assumption that he made there could have been reasonable when he was alive because in you know, like the end of World War I, World War II, most global economies were in shambles. And like the US economy, the British economy, maybe the German and French economies combined probably would have been 75 to 80% of the global economy. So yeah, he could maybe just arbitrarily ignore 20%, especially since that 20% wasn't globally integrated. So his assumptions were somewhat reasonable for the times. However, you think about, again, if there's more than one currency that's being circulated globally, there's no way he anticipated cryptocurrency, which is becoming all the rage, which would immediately make his entire argument invalid. A second component of his argument there that makes his argument invalid is he doesn't talk about levels of debt in any way. He only talks about current purchasing power. But there is debt in the world, both government debt and personal entity debt or you know credit card debt or businesses are in debt, right? Now, if the interest rate is fixed, well, inflation is actually good for that debt because then that debt gets relatively cheaper. But if the interest rate is variable, then inflation actually really has no impact and the person, well, in a lot of ways it will have an impact because the person will have to pay more dollars at that future devalued price. So it's actually really bad when there's variable interest rates as well. Uh, so in the end, just inflation is bad, in, or I should say rapid changes in the value of currency is always going to be bad. And then the final thing he says that I want to just go into is he states inflation or devaluing the currency is good because it prevents a family from hoarding wealth for eternity. And that's just stupid. I mean, that's just relegated to like biblical times when they said that the accumulation of wealth was bad, but capitalism has basically proven that wrong. Uh, so I think it's just rooted in that like bad ideology from the ancient world when there was actually a limitation on resources and like hoarding gold would actually kind of be bad. Uh, but now in the modern world, that is no longer the case. John Maynard Keynes is often quoted as being the number one like scholar against deflation. And I'm pro deflation. I believe John Maynard Keynes is wrong. The reason why he is wrong is perfectly ex given as an example here in, uh, on page 24. And what I'm going to say is he gives an example of 30 to 40% deflation, which is terrible. And he's correct in that statement. But a goal of 0 to 1% deflation should be the goal of a stable macroeconomic policy. So just keep that in mind of I, deflation of 0 to 1% is good. Hyperdeflation of 30 to 50% bad. So let's read this quote on page 24. Quote, on the other hand, when prices are falling 30 to 40% between the average of one year and that of the next, as they were in Great Britain and in the United States during 1921, 
Even a bank rate of 1% would have been oppressive to business since it would have corresponded to a very high rate of real interest. End quote. So let me break that down. What he's saying is if banks were still charging 1% interest on loans while uh, prices, you know, while there's 30 to 40% deflation, it would kill the economy because no one would take out banking investments. And that's correct. That would completely kill the entire kinetic energy of economics, which is like one of the key components of modern monetary policy. Uh, like economic kinetics is, what I'm, is the goal. And so if no one is investing anything, no one's buying anything, you're going to have zero kinetic energy in the economy. Um, let's see. Finishing, quote, anyone who could have foreseen the movement even partially would have done well for himself by selling out his assets and staying out of business for the time being, end quote, right? So if you're expecting prices to fall 30 to 40 percent, again, it's your best thing to do is just to get into a cash position, right? Because then cash is going to increase in value 30 to 40 percent, while all tangible goods are going to decrease 30 to 40 percent annually. So you would just get into cash, hold cash until the hyper deflation ends. That is correct. Again, hyper deflation is bad. Zero to one percent deflation is good. The final thing that is a flaw in his assumption, again, when he's given this example is, even a bank rate of 1% would have been oppressive to the business. That's correct, right? Because again, it would be a 30 to 41% loss, um, which would be terrible uh, year over year. But he assumes that the banks cannot do negative interest rates. He just assumes that the only way for a bank to lend money is with positive interest rates. However, I have done a case study on the student loan market where I prove how negative interest rates could be done, and I can take it a step further in the future if necessary. But it's just a limitation in his thinking where John Maynard Keynes, who's always using the math to be fancy and funny, limits his own math to only positive interest rates. And that's why you can never trust totalitarian types because they always omit the key factors that are the flaws in their argument. What you have to realize if you're a citizen as opposed to a government worker is the government is not a business and so it, it cannot just increase a product to make money. All it can do is extract wealth from its citizens. Uh, so to give an example of how they do that, one, it's either taxation or another hidden tax is inflation. And just to drive that home on page 48, quote, nevertheless, it is evident that so long as the public use money at all, the government can continue to raise resources by inflation. Moreover, the conveniences of using money in daily life are so great that the public are prepared rather than for, are prepared rather than forgo them to pay the inflationary tax provided it is not raised to a prohibitive level, end quote. So again, it's just like, the, what he's saying there, I mean, word for word, yes, taxation is theft, inflation is another form of taxation, which is theft, but the public will take it because they don't have a choice because money is just nice and easy. But again, now there's crypto coming in and the government now has competition. Now I do say that he's very smart and sometimes I agree with him. And on this one, I'm going to agree with him completely. And it's about the dangers of inflation. And he goes into excessive inflation. Uh, and I think he needs to bring that back to just regular inflation as well. But on page 61, where he talks about uh, German, Germany after World War I, when they're trying to raise money to pay for the penalties imposed by the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I, which, like, you know, everybody knows that treatment caused the economic fallout of Germany and made, like, World War II almost inevitable because they just had to fight for resources. Uh, anyways... So this quote on page 61, quote, the recent history of German finance can be summarized thus. Reliance on inflationary taxation, whilst extremely productive to the exchequer in its earliest stages, especially whilst the foreign speculator was still buying paper marks, gradually broke down the mark as a serviceable unit of account. One of the effects of which was to render unproductive the greater part of the rest of the revenue collecting machinery, as most taxes being necessarily assessed at some interval of time before they are collected. So let me stop for a second. Two things there. So first, inflation's good as long as foreign currencies are still buying the dollar, right? Because they're the ones getting more screwed over. Because um, they're going to be buying it, then it's going to be worth less once they spend it. Um, so they're paying, but once the foreign currencies stop using the dollar, then the, the run on the dollar happens and the demand goes down. It, like, it becomes a compounding thing. And you're going to see that in the near future with the U.S. as currencies are ditching the U.S. dollar as its reserve currency because there are other more stable options. 
The second thing I want to go into is the taxation uh, mechanism there, where you see, when you have hyperinflation, there are these things called shoe leather costs, where it's like the, the, the time it takes just to get to the bank, your money has already lost its value. So people are just rushing to get stuff into the bank so that they can start getting interest on it to keep up with the inflation, if that's an option. Uh, and so what he's saying is sometimes if inflation is so great, like you tax the citizen, right? You get your, your money taken out of your check, but it takes time for the government to get that money. And so shoe leather costs at the government level make it so that even taxation is worthless. And then inflation becomes the only form of revenue uh, generation for the government. And that is when economies completely collapse. Um, but I thought that was brilliant. So continuing, quote, the failure of the rest of the revenue rendered the treasury more and more dependent on inflation until finally the use of legal tender money had been so far abandoned by the public that even the inflationary tax ceased to be productive and the government was threatened by literal bankruptcy, end quote. So that's literally like the people of your country don't want your dollars. External countries don't want your dollars. Why? Because you, your policies are making it not desirable. So like Joe Biden just devalued the U.S. currency 20% in one year to chase down his own tyrannical dreams of imposing his values and ethics on the entire country. As a result, he stole 19 to 20% of everyone's life savings. Um, yeah, so why would anyone trust him in the future? Because if you can expect 19% theft year over year, the U.S. dollar should go to shit. Here's another statement that he makes that I completely agree with. And unfortunately, instead of it being used as a warning to the tyrant, it's actually their playbook on how they can take more money from you. Uh, so on page 62, quote, what is raised by printing notes is just as much taken from the public as is a beer duty or an income tax. What a government spends, the public pays for. There is no such thing as an uncovered deficit, end quote. I love that. There is no such thing as an uncovered deficit. So this national debt that's like $35 trillion now, it's going to come due at some point. The problem that you're facing right now, if you've ever seen the movie Dodgeball when they're like, you know, we could pay it in Canadian dollars because they're devalued. That's what every stupid politician that is espousing uh, Keynesian economics and inflation are saying, except what they're saying is instead of paying it with today dollars, we'll pay it in future dollars. It's the same thing as that moronic argument from the movie Dodgeball, but somehow all of our politicians have bought it and are shoving it down your throat. Why? Because it enables them to expand the, uh, the, the, the monetary supplies in the US and enact their totalitarian policies. And somehow they still think it's good for the economy. And like, it's just amazing the psychological sales pitch that happened to these guys that they think somehow devaluing the currency, which is the bedrock of the, uh, of their entire, of the entire country is somehow good. It just makes no sense. And somehow these smart people have bought it. This next quote on page 106, he gets completely correct. And that is, and that's with no assumptions. So on page 106, quote, the conclusion is generally drawn and quite correctly that budgetary deficits covered by a progressive inflation of the currency render the stabilization of a country's exchanges impossible and that the cessation, cessation of any increase in the volume of currency due to this cause is a necessary prerequisite to a successful attempt at stabilizing." End quote. Literally says, if you devalue the currency, you cannot have a stable economy. And what is Joe Biden's number one economic policy? Devaluing the currency. That is why we will not have stability in the future. Now let's get into our complete and total fundamental difference, inflation versus deflation. And that is on page 149, quote, when therefore the depreciation of the currency has lasted long enough for society to adjust itself to the new values, deflation is even worse than inflation. Both are unjust and disappoint reasonable expectation, but whereas inflation, by easing the burden of national debt and stimulating enterprise, has little to throw into the other side of the balance, deflation has nothing. So right there he says, like, inflation's not good, but deflation's terrible. And again, I've already pointed out he usually cites hyperdeflation and not like reasonable zero to one percent deflation. Um, but what he talks about, where he's talking about like easing the debt, right? Again, if you're paying in future dollars, he thinks it's gonna be easier to pay off the national debt. And the other thing he talks about is 
if a business fails and they have to they can pay it in future dollars right same thing it'll be easier for them to pay off their failures right so if a business over leverages itself and then fails inflation helps them and that is kind of correct but then that what that really does is incentivizes bad investments he doesn't put any cost on that at all at the same time he mentions deflation has no impact that's good that's completely wrong he doesn't value demand stimulus in any way right if you if you think about like uh, trickle down economics the way it's supposed to be worked and has never been implemented properly if you increase the purchasing power of every single individual what are they going to do spend more money when they spend more money every business has more customers and has more reason to invest in their business so it's just a different way of looking at it. One is the government controls all the power and uh, allocation of resources through inflation. The other is the individual controls all the resources and allocation through their demand spending. So deflation of zero to 1% actually increases the power of the consumer, increases the buying power of the consumer, increases the demand for the merchant's products by 1% every year. So that should be a compounding good year over year as opposed to as you mentioned, somehow possibly it'll help out failing businesses. So on one hand, you allow the market, if you have inflation, of, of uh, uh, if you have inflation, yeah, it'll help out failures. That's good, I guess. But you could also just use bankruptcy law to do that. The other thing of deflation actually empowers every single sh uh, shareholder of America, everybody who has a share, a, a dollar, will get stronger every year. And that doesn't even factor in the fact that the final big thing versus reasonable deflation versus inflation is salary negotiations. If you're expecting 20% inflation year over year, you need to negotiate that into your salary. And the average uh, low wage like a laborer is not going to have that capability, right? The only like a CEO of Bank of America is going to think of that. So as a result, every single individual gets poorer every year. Demand gets less every year with you when you have inflation. So just bad. Now he goes into hating on the gold standard quite a lot. And if you look at it again, getting away from the gold standard has pretty much been the downfall of modern economics, in my opinion. And what he says is, uh, gold has maintained its value throughout time. And he's like, oh, it's bad to rely on gold as the central of your currency, because what happens if like a mountain of gold gets discovered, which happened like, you know, I think in Africa, there was like gold veins that were found that really did a shock to the value of the currency. And if you study uh, history, like when the new world was discovered, like silver and gold, tons of that was discovered. And so like the values plummeted. At first, it was like a great huge shock to demand. And then it shot down and the values plummeted, right? Um, so that, and that does make sense. You don't want to have your the entire value of your country tied up in something that could just be harvested. And as we go into like space, there could be like a planet of gold. So like that's actually a reasonable uh, concern. Um, However, the reason why gold is a unit of measure, as he points out, is because it's maintained its value. It's something people want. People don't want a piece of paper with a print stuff on it. The only reason they want it is because it's backed by that gold. The origin of a banknote is actually from blacksmiths. I believe it was, I mean, yeah, it was like in uh, feudal England, if I remember correctly, uh, in order, if you had gold and you were tra tra trading that around, you could be robbed and killed for that gold. So you would go to a blacksmith, put your gold in the blacksmith safe, and the blacksmith would give you a note with how much gold you had. And then people would trade those notes, and that was a way to secure the gold. And it was like the or, or, like an early bank for peasants. Um, and then the government said, "That's a really effective thing. Let's take that over." And and then, they, as you know, it's illegal to mint money in the United States. So they took it over and made it illegal to, to do the, the thing that actually made it valuable in the first place. So that's just kind of the two components. One, gold, silver, all those things, they're valuable because they're valuable. And then dollar amounts are not valuable unless they are forced to be valuable based off of government and accepted means of exchange. And it'll just be interesting as people stop wanting to use those currencies, how the values will plummet. Well, that does it for this video, guys. Again, it is A Tract on Monetary Reform by John Maynard Keynes. And he's one of the most impactful uh, thinkers of the modern world. And you have to think about why that is. It's not necessarily because he's the most correct or the smartest thinker. It's because his policies are designed to empower the tyrant. And so therefore, the tyrant is going to be drawn to them. 
Uh, I, on the other hand, again, disagree with most of his beliefs because he is a totalitarian tyrant who believes in government control of everything. And I'm a free market guy. So I wanted to just read this and get his thoughts. And again, I, now after I read it, it kind of has emboldened me even more because now I believe 100 percent deflation of zero to one percent should be the goal of the Federal Reserve. And uh, as a final thought. We need the Federal Reserve. I, he talks about how like several times in there about central banks being bad. And I disagree. Like we need the Federal Reserve. It's just been led poorly. And the Federal Reserve needs better leadership, better guidance, and it can help create the prosperity that America deserves in the future, as opposed to the Federal Reserve as it's become kind of a puppet of the tyrant where we need a, a chairman of the Fed that can tell Joe Biden no. And unfortunately, we haven't had a chairman that had any balls since Paul Volcker. Anyways, thanks again. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a good day.